Hello everyone, welcome to FedScoop TV. My name is Greg Otto and we're coming from the Security Through Innovation Summit today and I'm talking with Phil Lieberman, the CEO and founder of Lieberman Software. Phil, thanks for joining us today. Thanks. So, how does your company help the government improve its cybersecurity posture? Oh gosh, in so many different ways. Um, one of the things that we do is we provide automation to them. So in terms of them having issues with getting enough labor to do cybersecurity and remediation, our technology allows them to magnify their capability. And we also provide remediation. So for existing legacy systems that are in place, they can use our tools to clean them up. They can also use them for health checks. We're also involved in something called privileged access and also privileged identity management. Okay. And also privileged access management. So the idea behind this is that we control who's got access to what for how long and also provide attestation so that they understand who's got access to what and for what reason. So we're also part of something called adaptive cyber response or adaptive cyber defense. Okay. The idea behind this is that if they see a threat on a network, they can actually call our technology. And what we'll do is we will change all the passwords and all the SSH keys on that network so that if somebody gets in, uh, manages to steal a key or a credential, we can change it in just a few minutes. The other thing that we're also doing is working with other agencies that have legacy systems like IoT, command control and communication systems that are in the field that are currently being managed manually. And so they use our technology in order to make changes automatically. So for example, in one of our customers, it takes them two weeks to make password changes with our technology. That's only about five minutes. Wow, so okay. So we're here to help the government save money, to be secure, and also to get them to something called acceptable losses. Uh, the idea here is that we know in cyber warfare no solution is perfect. Our idea is that if you get past the perimeter, what we would like to do is make it so that we can limit the amount of time that an intruder can actually be in the environment and do any kind of damage with a stolen credential. Okay. So let's talk about that first part. You were talking about automation. Sure. How do you see automation evolving inside government agencies? Well, look, if you don't have enough people, that's really your only choice. The second issue is that when you look at the attacks, the attacks are launched by automated solutions. They simply pick a group of addresses, IP addresses to go after. They hit them with a series of automated tests to try different attacks. And then once they get in, then they then inventory them. And then they then use those resources that they've now compromised to either do damage or to do mass exfiltration of information. The advantage that the attacker has because of automation is speed, right. which allows them to get in and get out and do their business without actually being detected, or if they are detected, their work is already done. The other element that we're also dealing with is the fact that many types of tradecraft don't really leave a trail behind them. And so our philosophy behind this and what our technology does for the government is make an assumption that an attack is underway and then uses automation to deal with that to essentially clean the environment whether you can detect compromise or not. But automation is about speed to response, getting acceptable losses, reducing the cost to the government and to the taxpayers, and also allowing the government and allowing um, the different agencies to be able to accomplish their mission uh, at less cost and also a lot quicker than they currently do it today. And there's such a labor shortage today right. in terms of finding the right people to do the job. This allows them to magnify their capability. So we see ourselves as tool makers, as locksmiths, as uh, um, essentially providers of automated solutions where we even work with other companies. So we work with McAfee, of course, for this show, but we also work with companies like SailPoint, CA, IBM, Microsoft. Okay. And so we collaborate with them and collaborate with the vendors that are already in place in the federal government. And so we connect up to all of that that's already in place. So as a company, we see our role as providing platforms and providing uh, technology and then documenting that, making it openly available as to how it works, and then allowing either third-party contractors or the government itself to tie all of our technologies together to get better results. Okay, so outside of the technology, public-private partnerships have been so crucial for the federal government. How do you see public-private partnerships evolving or maturing in the future? So there's wonderful things that have been happening in the federal government and in these collaborations, and, and we can break them down along a couple of different lines, for example. Okay. Um, one of the things is that the technology, for example, that we develop for large cloud providers, 
uh, the automation uh, that we provide for them, the ability to deal with massive numbers of systems and to give them resiliency in the, in the cloud, it's the same technology we can also provide to the federal government. So the fact that the federal government now uses COTS or commercial off-the-shelf software um, and has loosened up things like common criteria um, has allowed them to adapt uh, this technology toward the benefit of their operations and also to re the reduction of their costs. Um, the other part that's also useful is that there is a co-sharing of best practices between the federal government and right. also commercial, which has also been really nice and useful. But the other thing that we see that's also good is we've even seen the creation of, of a new ecosystem in which uh, government, uh, private industry, and CNIs have begun to work together to share intelligence. And I don't mean this in intelligence in the sense of privacy, but simply the idea that if you attack one, you have attacked all of them. And so they have begun to cooperate with each other and to work with the courts, to work with law enforcement, so that you can tamp down attacks much more quickly. We saw some, uh, one keynote that I saw recently from Microsoft was from Brad Smith when he did his uh, presentation. He was talking about the ability to get a subpoena in a court order really in as little as 15 minutes that when they see a real attack they're really ready to go to the courts they know exactly what to file and and to work together even with their competitors to be able to knock right. these things down so the the lines between uh, commercial and government um, have changed uh, in terms of who protects who I would say that the private industry area and the government both mutually protect each other so the, the, the normal role where you'd see government protects its citizens, right. I really now see this as a partnership. Okay. Uh, both really doing the job for each other. Okay, great. Finally, what are one or two ways government agencies can improve their cybersecurity over the next six months? Something that's low-hanging fruit. Well, you know, so much of what happens in federal government is not always about money, but it's about politics. And right. But that's the same in commercial. Okay. The, the greatest thing that I think could happen would be for leadership of these different agencies to ask themselves a few fundamental questions with regard to, for example, in the area that we deal with in privilege. To ask themselves questions like, for example, should IT have unlimited privilege and unlimited access for all the time to any system that they want to get into. But, you know, that's that's an issue that affects us. But there's there's even a bigger issue, which is we would ask leadership to think about what the cost of some of their conveniences are. Today, we live in a world in which everybody wants to be able to get to everything and anything within their agency right. within seconds. They want to see it all on their desktop. The problem is that convenience has made it really easy for the bad guys. Yep. So we would ask them to step back. Just as I mentioned privilege, I'd ask them to step back and say, do they really need all the conveniences? Could they in fact add a human element? Could they add an air gap? Could they redesign the network? Could they redesign how you authenticate instead of one log into everything, maybe multiple logons, even perhaps split the networks up? What, we're, what I'm saying is that the best benefit that I have seen is that if you expect a breach, if you know it's coming, you can design the network to sustain uh, and survive and to be resilient. So the biggest takeaway is to consider as a leader to work with IT and to help them redesign the way the organization operates for better resiliency. Nobody wants another OPM. Nobody wants, you know, what's happened at some of the uh, intelligence agencies. Right. But all of those were based on too much access to too many people without really enough friction. So as crazy as it sounds, what we would ask leadership to do is to consider reintroducing friction into their IT environments to make it a little bit tougher uh, for their own people, but make it really tough for somebody who's not supposed to be there. Great. Phil. Appreciate your insight. Thanks for stopping by. My pleasure. For all of our videos, check out our YouTube channel. And for more information, check out fedscoop.com. I'm Greg Otto. Thanks for watching.